I just wanted to talk about how you two arrived at this character, what kinds of uh, direction that Joanna gave you to, to help understand uh, your character. Well, first of all, I think the fact that we were friends was nothing to do with the choice that Joanna made of, of having me um, as the lead. It was completely, she thought it, I was right for the role, and uh, so there were no, no favours there. Or, no. You know, she's very strict about her work, Absolutely. quite rightly, and uh, she just absolutely thought she was right, as did I, <laughs> because I was in a fairly similar situation in many ways to what was going on in the film, um, moving house and changing my life. Um, and I, th I knew, well, I, I, kn I knew, you know, if Joanna had confidence in me, I, I felt utterly safe because I knew her work, I knew how rigorous her work is, and I just, you know, I did feel safe. I felt I was in a safe pair of ha hands, and I completely gave myself to her. My only worries were, you know, silly, vain worries, I think, that probably any woman would have, you know, to expose yourself like that physically. Um, and I knew emotionally it would take a toll, uh, which it did, but um, so in terms of um, direction, it, it was an experience. <laughs> <laughs> because in some ways, Joanna gave us so much freedom that you know you you, you, you know you really trusted us as much as we trusted you. But on the on the other hand, there were some incredibly strict perimeters as well. You know, in terms of um, I don't know, it was it was strict and free at the same time, wasn't it? You explain how you yeah. did. Well, I, I don't know if I can explain, but I mean, Viv, this is the first time I've ever seen the film, so you've done very well yeah. to say all those things. <laughs> <laughs> I really want to know what you think. Um, but uh, yes, I suppose it is, a, it is a sort of combination of those things. I mean, I, 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 I sort of, um, I, I, I kind of think as I go along. So I came up with new ideas as I was making the film and we're shooting in chronological order, which I think is helpful, mm. was helpful for you and Liam. And then actually Liam says very similar things about the sort of balance of kind of freedom and kind of boundaries. And... I, w I mean, I would sometimes do, for example, the night before shooting a scene, I would, because um, they didn't see anything. I mean, they, just to say, actually, Viv and Liam, neither of them had been in a film before. So this is their first time on screen in this way, which I think is incredible. And I see them as actors. I don't see them as non-actors. Actually, I've kind of stopped describing you as a non-actor because I think you're an actor, both yeah. of you. Um, but, so, but they didn't see anything on paper, so they completely trusted my description of what I wanted to do. Mm. But then what I developed as we went along is sometimes on the day that we were shooting, I'd show you something, but uh, a scene that I'd written and I'd written all the dialogue, but I didn't give you long enough to worry or, or really enough time to sort of digest the lines, but just to give a sense of what I wanted. Because I, I, at a certain point as we were shooting, I thought it was important to give you a kind of clearer idea of where I was going. So it was kind of for me as well as for you and Liam. and, and um, it was, yeah, it's very hard to talk after the event because it's, as Viv says, it's a very intense process mm. and you're in this strange bubble as anyone who makes films knows. So, um, but they were, I mean, it was very exciting for me to cast in this way because I didn't know exactly how it would work out, but I had a strong instinct with both of them rather late in, in the day because the casting process took a long time and Olivia, who's here, knows the kind of, you know the whole journey of that. So um, it, yeah, it was it was a, a, a lot of trust and just kind of all plunging into this new experience for, for all of us. Great, and this is a question for both of you. While well, you guys get your questions ready, um, that the film is dedicated to James Mulvin. Can you talk about a little bit about for both of you how your character so physically attached to the house and emotionally and spiritually and intellectually, but also for you as a writer director, how the house was a sort of starting point creatively. Yeah, well, I mean, just to sort of bring us both into that, Viv and I both, Viv used to live in, um, in, in, in a modern house, a different era built in the 80s, mm. but kind of understood the sort of connection of, you'd lived in that house for a long time, understood that connection of how you become, you know, part of the walls, as, as your character says in the film. Um, but James Melvin was an architect I knew, and that's how I, I, I knew the house, because I met him and his um, Norwegian wife, wife, Elsa, in the sort of early 90s, and I kind of fell in love with the house as I sort of fell in love with them, in a way. And they were a very happy couple who, who lived in that house for many years. So that's how I knew, knew the place. And that place was, a, was, a, was, you know, I cast the house as well as mm. the characters. And that, you know, it is, it is a third character in a way. So I had to shoot in that place 
And we started to think if it didn't work out negotiating with the current owners to shoot there, what would we do shooting somewhere else? And it, I just think I couldn't have made the film really if, if it hadn't, hadn't been there. So, you know, that was important. And, and James Melvin sadly died a couple of years ago, but he was 99. And um, he, I feel he's quite underrated as an architecture, actually. He was quite well known for doing, um, for example, the British Airways terminal of JFK, a lot of mod modernist architecture in, in the, in during the 60s and, and into the 70s. And, and he, um, yes, he does most, mostly, or did mostly commercial work, but he built this house for himself and his wife, so it was a real project of love. Yeah, and also, I mean, in terms of the process, Liam and I lived in the house for the, for six, the six weeks of shooting, just us two. So we would wake up in the morning, have breakfast, then the film crew would arrive, and, you know, I might do a sex scene on that bed and go to bed, it, you know, sleep in it that night. So I, I really knew that house. I, <laughs> I mean, you know, I got quite possessive of it, actually. And, um, you know, I knew how everything worked, you know, which, of course, Joe and Anna wanted me to be completely comfortable with the house, but, and I was. You know, I knew how everything moved, everything slid. You know, I did fall in love with it, um, you know, and I, I did feel very possessive of it, actually, probably more than I did about my on-screen husband. <laughs> so that really worked, but, it, it, you know, it was a bit... Big Brother-esque, you know, in a way, living in that house for six weeks with someone you, you don't know. But it was, um, it was surprisingly easy in some ways as well, actually. And, and, and remarkable, because you didn't have any time in the house really before we started shooting. So it was, that was kind of the rehearsal process as we were shooting. So, you know, they were, they were yeah, you were thrown into that house because I cast you literally 10 days before the shoot and Liam even less than that. So, they, yeah, they were amazing. I mean, I think they're, you know, fantastic performers. Um, I want to talk about, I want to ask you about the sound design because I've just seen the film for the second time and I was really listening and it's so beautiful. It's really, it feels like there's a lot going on in terms of the narrative and the story and emotional connection with Viv's character. Um, and can you talk a little bit about that, uh, how you designed it, whether that was there originally, or is that part of your editing process? Um, sort of all, all of those things. I'm, I'm, I've become more and more interested in sound, and I knew that I didn't want to have incidental music, um, but I, that I wanted to have a very elaborate sound design, but I wanted the sound design to become musical. So I hope that at certain points it, 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 it is like music. I find everyday life, I'm, I'm in a way listening more than I'm looking and I, 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 he I hear a lot of music in, in sounds well like the scaffolding, the, the certain sounds in there which are, uh, are, 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 are like a score in a way. And then, um, and then I was really interested in this idea of stories but that are sort of told through sound because I find myself a lot, um, uh, particularly in sort of moments when I feel a bit anxious, I, I will invent stories out of things that I hear Usually, fortunately, those things don't, um, don't, <laughs> don't the things that I've imagined don't, don't really hap end up happening. But, it's, but I wanted to sort of, uh, it's sort of in a way, this idea of what, what could happen. Um, and I, want, I wanted that to be told um, uh, I yeah, in the sound design. And I work very closely with a wonderful sound design called Yo Jovan Adair. And he's, um, we've collaborated now three times. So he did the sound design on the other two films as well. But I think we took this a lot further than the other two films and, and, and made something more complex. And we spent a long time and I enjoy recording sounds myself and it's, it's, a, yeah, it's a passion, definitely. Yeah. And there's uh, the sort of more naturalistic incidental sounds that are very textured, but there's also that great sequence in the middle that's stylized and you're not sure whether, whether it's happening or what's going on in the sound in that is particularly beautiful. Um, Viv, for you when, you, when you came to this film, did you, did the script, did, does Joanna like give you a script that looks like a conventional script? I know you started to talk about this a little bit, um, but what, what, is a, what does a Joanna Hogg script look like um, when you get it? It's, um, so what Joanna really does is you kind of don't know from one day to the next what's happening. And I trusted that process because uh, Joanna knows what she's doing. So I wasn't sort of bolshy about that or anything. So that in the morning you would, she would say, this is the feeling of the scene, um, it sort of begins here with this feeling and it ends there with that, um, it maybe weave in these three points, off you go. And some people would find that terrifying, but I would find it much more terrifying to learn a load of lines and make them believable than improvise and draw on my own life to, you know, to create what Joanna wanted. That 
that was an interesting challenge to me, whereas learning a load of lines and being some person wouldn't be. But this, this was so collaborative in a way that she pushed us, you know, so far in a way that we, we had to really draw on our whole life experiences to just bring small moments to the screen. You know, she didn't, Joanna didn't want big moments or overblown moments, but those tiny private moments to to be believable. And, you know, she, cho she chose us because she knew we, we had the depths to do that because of what we'd experienced kind of thing. So, no, so they were very loose, the, the scene, the sort of pieces of paper, weren't they? A couple of, maybe a couple of lines of dialogue or a shape, a shape to a scene more than anything. And uh, it, was, it was challenging, but so, it, it stretched us so much, or it stretched me so much, but in such a fantastically pleasurable way, in a way, you know, really to be given such, um, an exciting thing to do stretched me mentally, physically, and emotionally, all three ways um, for those six weeks, yeah. And it's your first London set film, and I remember talking to you when you were just thinking about doing it, and that was really important to you that you make a film in London next. What, what was that experience like, and did it affect the way you created? Um, I thought it would actually, but I mean, as you can see, I, I, I'm sure some people are thinking, well, it's sort of London, but it's so a lot of it's inside a house, <laughs> so you hear London more than you see London. But um, I, yes, I thought there would be more problems shooting sort of outside in the street, but it was, it, it, yes, it was okay, but we were very controlled about it. So it, it um, yes, I, I, I found it much easier than I expected, but then a lot of it is internal, and actually, I experienced. At the beginning of the shoot, my crew, I have to thank Ed, who's here, and, and Stefan, the production designer, um, for kind of pushing me. I, I, I'd sort of written the script in a certain way, and I'd included these dreamlike passages, um, like in the ICA, for example. And I, I had a loss of confidence near the beginning of the shoot, where I suddenly thought, I just want everything to be inside the house. I, don't, I felt a bit like D, actually. I didn't want to leave the house. It was much safer in the house. Why do we have to go and shoot all these other scenes? And I really have to sh thank Ed and Stefan for, for saying, no, you, they're, they're really good ideas. You, you know, you must go for that and, and, and to kind of stick with kind of what I'd planned. Yeah. None of us wanted to leave the house, did we? That's it, just saying that none of the crew or us wanted to leave the house. We, we, we really did get sort of yeah. bedded down in there and it felt weird just doing a, a scene outside down the road. It, it's amazing how sort of womb-like it became, didn't it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think possibly as a compliment to you, critics find it tricky to categorize your work. I mean, some people see you as existing more in a tradi tradition of European cinema. Some people see you as a sort of new uh, interpretation of social realism, focusing on it maybe a different social class. Do you feel like a British filmmaker? Is it important to you that you're telling British stories to the rest of the world? Um, or is this, would, would you agree with, with Dee that it's very reductive to have to classify yourself? Well, I'm 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 not. It's going to sound very um, um, patriotic, but I, I I don't. I mean, it's very hard to. I see. My, I always I've always seen from a y being a young child myself as an outsider. So I don't I don't feel I really belong anywhere in some ways. I mean, I'm still sort of grappling with that. So I this idea of being British. I'm 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 not sure what what that means exactly. And I'm and I'm concerned. In fact, we had this discussion earlier today at the BFI about, uh, about British cinema. And I feel, yes, I feel I'm a filmmaker and I don't want to, yes, I don't want to sort of, put, yeah, I think to put myself in that box. I mean, I don't mean, I'm interested in a lot of films that have been made in this country, but I don't, I, yes, I have difficulty with defining myself in that way. 